This lecture is on a topic called coupled mode theory. And it, it's simple in concept and the pictures make it simple, but the mathematics behind coupled mode theory can get pretty ridiculous. I will step you through it, but the most important thing here for us is to come away with the picture of what's happening. And in fact, almost every device in existence can probably be explained from a coupled mode theory. To begin our discussion of coupled mode theory, we have to talk about what an electromagnetic mode is. And in fact, the word mode is used for a lot of different things. So we need to have a basis of what we mean by what mode is. Then we can discuss the details of coupled mode theory. And I like to divide it into three categories. Co-directional coupling, we are coupling between modes that are traveling together in the same direction. Contra-directing directive coupling, we are coupling modes that are traveling in opposite directions but along the same line. And then non-directional coupling where we have waves traveling in completely different directions but overlapping in some volume of space and we want to couple energy between those. And the non-directional coupling really re leads into what we call phase matching. And this is where we learn to couple energy from one waveguide to the next or an external wave into a waveguide or, or really anything. And then a related topic, but something slightly different, just seems like it goes well here. I want to talk about mode matching versus coupled wave models of describing electromagnetic systems. And they appear to describe different things. And what I'll do is describe that and try to reconcile really why they do describe the same thing, just differently. So what are modes? It's really any time we have a packet of electromagnetic power that propagates independent of anything else. Nothing's going to interfere with it in a, in a linear, linear medium. And so very often this is different modes in a waveguide. Maybe different polarization states we call different modes. Maybe we have the same wave, but two different waves traveling in different directions. We'll call those modes. Anytime that there's a packet of electromagnetic power that is somehow independent of everything else, we will call a mode. So an example, modes in a waveguide. We know if the waveguide's large enough relative to the wavelength, it will support multiple modes. Each of those modes can propagate through the waveguide independently. We have different polarization states. We know that a plane wave polarized along the x-axis will not interfere with a plane wave polarized along the y-axis. Likewise, right-hand circular, left-hand circular, they're orthogonally polarized. And we can talk about the different polarization states as modes. Similar to waveguide analysis, we may have a resonant cavity that we can pump energy into and, and get energy out. and Resonators can resonate in different mode configurations. We'll have a fundamental mode, a second, third, fourth order mode, and they're independent packets of electromagnetic energy. Now we're ready to move into coupled mode theory. It's easiest, for me anyway, it's easiest to start this discussion talking about modes in two different waveguides, and eventually we will couple these. So I also drew two different waveguides because these don't have to be similar waveguides. We can couple energy from a microstrip into a dielectric waveguide, um, really any two modes. So here I'm drawing a triangular waveguide, which has a mode shaped something like this, and then a rectangular waveguide, which has a mode shaped like this. And these are dielectric waveguides, by the way. So I can, in general, write the mode solution for the first mode as some amplitude function in the cross section times how it propagates in the z direction, which in this case will be in and out of the board. And I can do that for both the electric and magnetic fields, and I can do that for both the first and second waveguide, or first and second mode that we'll talk about. So what we want to do now is couple these modes. So what we'll do, we'll bring these waveguides in very close proximity. and then what we do is we model this as one big weird waveguide and what we see are what are called super modes and your your model or the analysis thinks it's just one big waveguide 
but kind of to us because we remember there really were two separate waveguides, we can look at this in a slightly different framework. But we really have these super modes, and what ends up happening will pump energy into one waveguide. As it propagates, if the waveguides are close enough, it will start spilling power over into the second waveguide. So here's how I like to visualize this. We have our triangle and square waveguides. And let's say we pump energy in here. And I'm drawing this, you know, foggy, cloudy. That's supposed to represent the mode. As it propagates, it is slowly spilling power over into the other guide. And at some point, there's actually zero power in the first waveguide, and it's all over in the second waveguide. Then if it keeps propagating, well, it goes back again and then back again. And in principle, this repeats. And the, the energy swaps back and forth between the waveguides as, as far as it propagates. So that's how we visualize the couple modes. What we want to do now is put a mathematical basis behind this. We will use something called perturbation analysis. And there is a very big approximation built into this. We know, as we bring these two waveguides in close proximity, that when those waveguides get close, the modes will perturb a little bit and look a little bit different. The approximation that we're going to make is assume that that does not happen, that we can bring these waveguides in close proximity so that they're coupled, but the modes look the same. So we make that assumption. Now we can write the overall electric and magnetic fields this way. We have E1. Remember, that's the electric field for the mode in the first waveguide. E2 is the, the electric field for the mode in the second waveguide. And we can say as they propagate in the Z direction, they, the, the first mode will have some amplitude A, and the first mode will have some amplitude B. And from the picture on the previous side, if we pump our energy in, all into E2, this B will be 1 at first, and as it propagates, B will get smaller and smaller and smaller, and A will get bigger and bigger and bigger, as suddenly the mode in the first guide becomes the, the dominant mode. So somehow A and B are the amplitudes, and they're exchanging energy back and forth. And we can write the same equation for the electric or the magnetic fields. So this is the start of our analysis. Now please understand I'm skipping a lot of steps here. And uh, uh, I don't really think the steps are important for our purposes. But uh, if you dive heavy into coupled mode theory, it's definitely worth going ahead and deriving these equations. But at the top... We, I repeated what we had on the last slide. That's our solution. What we want to do, we have an expression for the electric field and the magnetic field. We can substitute those things, those two expressions, into Maxwell's curl equations. When we do, and after a lot of algebra, we come out with these two equations. And just a hint, if you are going to derive this on your own, I made use of this vector identity, which helped me get from these two equations substituting the curl equations to here. Notice we have an ordinary derivative. That's because there's only one independent variable left, z. x and y are gone. From Poynting's theorem, we, we saw an expression something like this from, from a previous electromagnetic class. But we can describe, in general, the power leaving a volume and add it all up. Uh, and so here's how we do it. We do a surface integral, a closed surface integral about some volume. And so we can picture it this way. We have some volume and we have power either going out or coming in. And if we add all that, uh, we can leave the total power leaving that volume. Well, if we move the surface out to infinity, nothing can leave it because nothing can leave infinity. So in fact, if we do that, we, we make our limits of integration infinity we can set that integral to zero. We're also free to inject complex conjugates uh, willy-nilly as we choose at this point. And we'll use that feature later. So at the top of this slide, I repeated our equations previously. We take the two integral equations that we had at the end of the last slide and we substitute these equations into that. So we will get two new equations set equal to zero. Now, after a lot of algebra, and the, the buzzwords in the literature would be, it is easily shown that. In reality, it's not easily shown. It's a lot of work, but 
from the last two equations on the last slide, if there are a lot of algebra, we end up here. And these are called the generalized coupled mode equations. The only approximation built into those is that the shapes of the modes don't change as we bring the waveguides in close proximity. We know that's not quite reality, but it is pretty close, especially if the waveguides are close enough to be coupled, but not so close that the modes really change a lot. Well, a bunch of big integrals come out of this and some constants. We have this kappa, KP, kappa PQ, which is this big ugly expression, and we call that the mode coupling coefficient. We have a C sub PQ, which we will call the butt coupling coefficient. And we also have a chi sub P, which we call a change in our propagation constant. And in the following slides, we're going to talk about exactly what that is. So the mode coupling coefficient really describes how quickly power goes from one waveguide into the next, or from one mode into the next. Um, so we can think about how efficiently it leaks, how efficiently it couples, and we call that our mode coupling coefficient. Next we have a butt coupling coefficient. It may be that our waveguides aren't next to each other. We have uh, essentially one butted right up against the other, but maybe offset, maybe they're not offset, maybe they look differently, so the mode from one is not excited into the other exactly efficiently, so we have a coefficient that describes when we sort of end fire, excite one waveguide from another, how efficiently that happens. And so we characterize that with our butt coupling coefficient. Then we also have a change in propagation constant. That makes sense. We started off with a single waveguide where the mode had one propagation constant. We bring another up close to it. That has to change the propagation constant because now all of a sudden your mode is overlapping another core with a higher dielectric constant or higher refractive index. So it makes sense that the propagation constant would change a little bit. And it changes by this parameter. Um, usually this is very small and a lot of analyses just set that equal to zero and still get uh, very accurate results. In fact, we'll do that in, in some following slides. So it's maybe easy to confuse mode coupling and butt coupling, so I'm drawing this picture here. At this first section here, we have a, a mode that's traveling left to right along this waveguide, and suddenly is the start of a second waveguide. This would be a butt coupling mechanism because that energy is suddenly slams into the face of this waveguide and probably excites its mode. That's butt coupling. The mode coupling is when we have a, a mode traveling along that is coupled evanescently, really to the evanescent fields, and it's coupled and it's slowly, gradually, over a distance, leaking energy into the, the second waveguide. So think of butt coupling more as an instantaneous, abrupt thing at the end of a waveguide. Mode coupling is where we have a, a length and energy is slowly spilling from one waveguide into the other. So what we want to do, it's useful to simplify these equations, is normalize the power and the modes that we, we calculated in one of the first slides for the, the modes and the waveguide. That, so that's describing our, our super mode or the modes in the individual waveguides. So the total power in a waveguide is described by this first equation. We notice we had three big ugly equations before for the, the mode coupling coefficient, butt coupling coefficient, and the change in propagation constant. Uh, what we can notice is that the denominator is actually four times the power in the waveguide. So to get rid of that big ugly expression in the denominator, let's normalize the eigenmodes by that constant. So they're not there anymore. Once we normalize, interestingly, uh, we get symmetry in some of our parameters. The butt coupling coefficients have, a, I guess, a complex conjugate symmetry, and uh, the change in propagation constant, depending which waveguide, has a, also a symmetry. Again, another, it's easily shown that, meaning there's really a lot of algebra behind that that I don't want to get into here. Let's take a look at the power in the super mode. Well, again, we'll apply the same equation for calculating power. And if we throw in our equations and another time where we can say it is easily shown that, 
we can actually calculate the power in our super mode. Keep in mind, we are using, we've normalized the power in the eigen modes, but here's the overall power in the super mode. And out comes this constant uh, delta, which is essentially the, the difference in the propagation constants divided by two between the two modes and the two waveguides. So the way we've described this, we have two waveguides and we have power that sort of dances back and forth between the two waveguides. If we ignore loss, what we can see is that the, the total power is still there. It's just which waveguide it is in. So if we were to look at the total power as a function of Z, we have to be conserving that power. So the change in P or power as a function of the Z direction has to be zero. Well, if we apply that to the equation on the previous slide, we get this big ugly condition. Now, in order to satisfy this independent of Z, that reduces down to this condition, <clears throat> which really relates the two mode coupling coefficients to this detuning parameter delta to the, the butt coupling coefficient. It turns out we would like to have this kind of symmetry, and we usually do where this is relating the mode coupling coefficient going from the second waveguide to the first to the mode coupling coefficient going from the first waveguide to the second. It makes a little bit of sense that the coupling would be the same, but we can see from this equation that's not necessarily true if they have different propagation constants. We can actually have faster leakage, if you will, or faster coupling from one waveguide to the other than the other way. So, but this is usually the case where it is the same, and we have two conditions where that happens. If the propagation constants are the same, then this delta parameter is zero. Well, if the delta parameter is zero over in this equation, then we, then we can relate the two kappa terms. The other way we could do it, if the C term is zero, well, how is that? So the waveguides are sufficiently separated so that that C term is approximately zero. Um, usually this is the case, and that last term, that two delta C term, is, is usually ignored in a, in a coupled mode analysis. And in fact, it's so common that this mode coupling symmetry condition is what I think of when I think of couple mode. I think of the, the mode leaking from one waveguide to the other happening the same as going back again, that they're not happening at different rates. Okay, so we normalize things and it turns out our coupled mode equations can be written a bit more simply. And so here's where we are. Here's our couple mode equations, and we've grouped a bunch of stuff into some kappa and alpha terms. If we make the assumptions we did in the previous slide, where the propagation, the change in propagation constant won't happen, propagation constants will stay the same, the C term is zero. If we do that, the previous couple mode equations reduce to this. And in fact, this is the starting point for most coupled mode analyses. I notice they look very pretty, they start to be very intuitive, uh, and most analyses start there. But I wanted you to see that there's some assumption, there's some things that really have to be the case for these to be completely valid. So now we have the general setting for coupled mode theory, and there's three special cases. There's co-directional coupling, contra-directional coupling, and then a non-directional coupling, or what I call non-directional. So we'll step through the math for co-directional coupling next. So here's the picture of it. We have two waveguides. We pump power into one waveguide. As it propagates, it slowly leaks over to the other guide, and at some magical distance, in fact, we would have 100% of the power in the second waveguide. If we kept going, it would start to leak back. But both wave, the modes of both waveguides that we've coupled, they're both forward propagating, they're both happening along the same line, so we call that co-directional. In co-directional coupling, we have modes traveling in the same direction, so the propagation constants of the two mode has the same sign. We have a reciprocity condition. And most of the time, we have a real mode coupling coefficient. Uh, the complex means that, that as one mode leaks into the other, it's changing phase. Most of the time, that that's real. And so rather than write kappa 1, 2, or kappa 2, 1, we'll just call it kappa. 
all of, after all of this, if we solve those general couple mode equations, here's where we end up. So this is what's describing the amplitudes of the modes as they propagate down the waveguide. And notice we have complex exponentials here. Thus, the exchange of energy back and forth between the guides follows a cosine pattern. So we put our boundary conditions in, and here's really the final solution. And we see our sines and cosines. So on the last slide, we derived the, the behavior of the amplitudes of the modes as they propagate. We can also look, and it's probably even more meaningful, to look at the behavior of the power in each mode as they propagate. When we do all that, we end up here with these equations. And now instead of having an exchange of amplitude following a cosine, we have an exchange of power really following a sine squared profile. But it still looks pretty close to a cosine. So if we looked at those functions as a function of distance, so here's a function of distance, and we're looking at the power in the two waveguides, what we would see is we would initially excite one waveguide and power would be 100%, power in the other mode 0%, as it propagates, it starts spilling power in the other guide, and at some point, we have a maximum here. And when it is a maximum, the other's at a minimum. And so 100% of the energy coupled over. And this energy, as we keep going, just keeps swapping back and forth. So the power from one guide goes over to the first, or the power from the second guide goes over to the first, and from the first to the second, and it bounces back and forth. So we can discuss something called the coupling length. And this is the length over which 100% of the energy goes from one guide to the next. So for example, in this top slide, our coupling length would go from here to here. And so we can derive our coupling length from the couple mode equation parameters. Usually the propagation constants are the same because we're coupling the same waveguide. And here's a real simple equation for the coupling length. It's pi divided by two times the the coupling coefficient. And likewise, we could solve this for the coupling coefficient, and that would be 2 pi divided by the coupling length. So that's the discussion of co-directional coupling. Now we want to talk about contra-directional coupling. This is where your modes are traveling in opposite directions. And the common word for this is a Bragg grading. So in a Bragg grading, we are coupling a forward wave into a backward wave. So in fact, the propagation constants now have to have opposite sign. Given that they have opposite sign, we have a reciprocity condition now where there's a negative sign between our mode coupling coefficients. That makes sense. The negative sign has to be there because one wave's traveling backward, the other's traveling forward. So it turns out, when we were talking about co-directional coupling, just bringing two waveguides in proximity, that did it. We coupled them and we have co-directional coupling. That's not the case for contra-directional coupling. And we still want to bring two waveguides in close proximity, maybe they're even overlapping, but now we need to introduce a grating. And it's the interaction of the wave and the grating that actually couples the, the forward to the backward wave. And what we see is that our coupling coefficient is now actually a function of z. So given opposite signs on the betas, we revise our coupled mode equations, and we also have our revised reciprocity condition on the mode coupling coefficient. And we have what we call a phase matching condition. This is really the condition that that we have to impart on the grading so that it successfully couples the two modes. And it turns out we can define uh, a psi parameter here. And we have three cases to analyze. So in the first case, this psi parameter is larger than the coupling coefficient. We have one where it's equal and one where it's less than. And it turns out this describes the pass band, band edge, and the stop bands 
of this Bragg stop band. And we can go back to our couple mode parameters, we can apply these conditions, and we can calculate where the band edges and stuff are and bandwidth, the stop bands, etc. So the first case, in the pass band where that psi parameter is greater than, than our mode coupling coefficient. It turns out, again, it is easily shown that, and we have these amplitude constants or amplitude functions as a function of z that end up with these big ugly expressions, but we see sines and cosines again. We can also look at it in terms of the power as a function of z. And here I have the forward power and the backward power. And we see again, we see a sine squared profile. We look at what happens on the band edge. At the top we have the amplitude terms as a function of z. At the bottom we have the power as a function of z. And then in the stop band, this is where it's reflective. This is where we have the strongest coupling between the forward and backward wave. At the top we have our amplitude terms. In the bottom we have our power terms. Now notice suddenly we have these hyperbolic functions. So these are sort of like decaying exponentials, if you will. And the reason that's decaying is because when we are coupling, that forward wave decays because it eventually just gets reflected. We're in the stop band here. So it makes sense then that we're starting to see these hyperbolic trig functions. Here's a typical Bragg response. In my opinion, understanding this Bragg response is, is more important than, than knowing the equations we just covered. But typically, if we look at the reflection on the red line, we have some ripples, but we have this band of very, very high reflection, and we call that the stop band. And then on either side, we have our two pass bands, and then right in the middle, um, it turns out these Bragg gratings get very dispersive, and that's used even. Uh, you'll see that a lot for dispersion compensation in optical fibers. They'll chirp a Bragg grating and compensate for the dispersion after going through the ocean or something. So that's a very typical Bragg response. Usually the width or the bandwidth of the Bragg response has to do that the higher the index contrast of the grading, the wider this will get. Um, the position of this is controlled by the period of the grading and the number of periods really controls how strong that reflection is. The center of the stop band is what's called the Bragg wavelength, and we have a nice easy equation for calculating that. So it's essentially twice the period times the effective refractive index. And then non-directional coupling. Now in non-directional coupling, here uh, I have to get away from waveguides because this is non-directional now, so let's think about modes in a different sense now. And let's say we have two plane waves, one traveling you know, left to right but upward a little bit at some angle, and then another wave maybe traveling in this other direction. We just arbitrarily chose that. Well, these would propagate independently, but we can couple energy between them using a grating just like in the, the Bragg grading. But we have to pay attention to the orientation of the grading, and it follows this nice equation. If we look at the difference between the two wave vectors, that difference should be our grading vector. Remember, the grading vector points in the direction of the grading. Its magnitude is 2 pi divided by the period of the grading. And the sign of that actually doesn't matter because whether the, the grading vector is the sign doesn't matter. The grading vector in opposite directions describes the same grading. So this really makes a triangle. We can write our two wave vectors and we can connect the tips and the vector that connects the tips is the grading vector. So as long as we have those two waves propagating through that specific grading, they will exchange energy and they will be coupled. But it's called non-directional coupling because they're not traveling in parallel and they're not traveling necessarily in opposite directions, they're in completely different directions, but we can still couple power between them. So we can generalize this concept even more. Let's say we have a waveguide and it has a mode propagating with some propagation constant beta and it trucks along the waveguide. 
But we also potentially have an external wave, a plane wave that would pass through this slab of material. And it has a wave vector I'll call beta 2. Probably should have written it as a K2 because it's a wave vector, but the propagation constant of a mode and a wave vector is really the same concept. It's 2 pi over the wavelength that describes the propagation of the wave and how it accumulates phase. So I wrote them both as beta here. But these are two completely different kinds of modes. One's a plane wave traveling through outer space, and the other one's a guided mode in a slab waveguide. Well, suppose we want to couple those two. How do we do that? Well, we do it with a grating. And we apply the same concept as the non-directional coupling. And the grating we need, the orientation of it and the magnitude and everything, is just the difference between the two propagation constants of the modes. The modes don't even need to look alike. They can be anything. But if we know their propagation constants, we can take the difference, and that difference is the grating that it would take to couple those two. So if in our slab waveguide we induced a sinusoidal grating, now suddenly we can actually couple energy from an external wave into a guided mode. And there's a lot of times that's done, grating couplers. We shine light onto a waveguide. We'll put a grating on it so that we can couple that into a guided mode. And we can also get the guided mode out. There's another structure called a guided mode resonance filter, which actually produces a spectral response based on coupling external waves into guided modes. And we will talk about those later in the semester as well. So let me generalize this and, and talk about gratings in three different regimes based on the period of the grating. It turns out the shortest period gratings will be contradirectional contra directional couplers, where they'll couple energy traveling in opposite directions. Our medium period gratings will be the non-directional coupling. And then co-directional coupling has very long gratings. Remember, all of these use a grating that is the difference between the two propagation constants of the modes. Well, in co-directional coupling, those propagation constants are very, very close. So the resulting grating vector can become very, very large. I'm sorry, very, very small. So the period of that grating actually becomes very, very large. So I like to think of these three regimes for gratings. So that's it for the couple mode theory. Now I want to move on to the, the mode matching picture versus a coupled wave picture of how power travels through a system. It could be a waveguide, it could be a metamaterial, a photonic crystal, could be anything. So both the mode matching and the coupled mode picture of how electromagnetic waves travel through devices uh, have the same framework. We, we divide them into layers that are uniform in the Z direction. And the Z direction is the dominant direction that your wave is traveling. But we're going to divide our device into uniform segments. And we're going to look at what happens in those uniform segments and what happens at the interface between those segments. First is the mode matching framework. So inside a waveguide, the field can look like almost anything. If we were to calculate the eigenmodes, or the modes supported by this waveguide, if it's a waveguide, we would have a set of those. And each one would have a weight, um, AM, so F would be what the mode looks like, A would be the weight. So whatever the field might look like has to be a weighted sum of those eigenmodes. So that's concept number one for the mode matching framework. The, the next concept, we have the same electric field profile, all the same modes with the same weights that we talked about on the last slide, but they also have different propagation constants and they will propagate at different speeds and they'll go in and out of phase and, and overall adding these up, the, the field can look rather complex but all that is really happening is that the modes are just traveling independently. They're just traveling at slightly different speeds and they're going in and out of phase. So really in the mode matching framework, there's not a whole lot interesting happening in the uniform segment. However much power is in each one of the modes, it stays that way, they propagate independently, and the modes just travel down the guide at different speeds and go in and out of phase. 
Now let's think about what happens at an interface. So we know it's kind of boring in the segments. It's just whatever amplitudes the modes have, they travel down the segment with those same amplitudes, and all they do is accumulate phase differently. So that happened going down the first guide, and we had some electric field profile. Well, we know through boundary conditions, we know what the field has to look like on the other side. We're ignoring reflections here. Well, it has to look the same because of the boundary conditions. But on this side, there's a different set of modes. They might look similar, but they're more stretched out. Perhaps they could look different. But the, the overall field has to look the same. So the energy, as it turns out, distributes itself amongst the eigenmodes differently because the eigenmodes look different. But once that happens, there's whatever amplitude happens to be in each of those eigenmodes, they then propagate independently and, and nothing interesting happens other than that they go in and out of phase because they're traveling at different speeds. So in the mode matching framework, the, the eigenmodes travel with whatever amplitude they have. The, the amplitudes amongst the eigenmodes scramble at the interface so that the, the overall field looks the same on either side of the interface. And then we have new weights on the new eigenmodes that travel uh, without effect after that. They don't, they, nothing changes. The amplitude in the second waveguide uh, goes to the end unaffected. So mode matching. And we, I describe this in the framework of waveguides, but it really can be anything. These can be modes in a photonic crystal, waves in air, waves in a grating, pretty much anything. So it applies to a lot of different stuff. But the modes in these uniform segments don't interact in the segments. Nothing really interesting happens. Just the modes travel separately and independently, but they travel at different speeds. And so they, they go in and out of phase with each other. But at an interface, that's when power amongst the modes scrambles. It has to scramble because on either side of the interface, the modes have to, the overall electric field has to look the same, but the modes look different on either side. So in mode matching, nothing interesting happens in the uniform segments, but the, the, the power scrambles itself at the interface between the two sections of the waveguide. Now let's look at the same problem from a coupled wave framework. And in this case, our waves will be plane waves. Well, we'll have the same waveguide for simplicity, and we have the same crazy electric field profile. And it turns out, we can decompose this into a set of plane waves traveling at different angles, such that if we added all this up, we'd get whatever this crazy electric field is. So we have plane waves. Before we had these eigenmodes with a, just a function f. Now we have plane waves with some amplitude am on each one of them. So those plane waves propagate, and they have their own amplitudes. Now, plane waves, as they propagate, are coupled in this coupled wave framework. So we have this overall electric field, which we've decomposed on a set of plane waves. And if we were to look at the amplitudes associated with each one of them, they would change as they propagate because they're coupled. They are exchanging energy in a uniform segment. And at the end, because the energy scrambled amongst the modes in the uniform segment, the field looks different. So now let's look at an interface again. Here we have plane waves. They're actually coupled and they are exchanging energy as they propagate. And so their, their amplitudes are, are changing. We get some crazy electric field here. Boundary conditions requires that it looks the same on the other side. And so it turns out the weights on the plane waves are the same because we have the same plane wave basis. But as they propagate, now the energy is scrambling itself amongst the modes because they're, they're coupled. So unlike the mode matching framework, here nothing interesting happens at the interface because the field's the same. Boundary conditions requires that. All the magic is happening in the segments where these plane waves are exchanging power. So, to conclude, on the coupled wave framework, again, this applies to just about anything. I, I described it in the context of waveguides, but it applies to much more. 
Here, the plane waves, the modes are interacting in the uniform segments. They're coupled and they exchange, they exchange energy, they accumulate phase, they do all this differently. But here, nothing interesting happens at the interfaces. The, the weights on the plane waves stay the same. All the magic happens in the uniform segments. Remember, in the mode matching, nothing interesting happened in the uniform segments. All the modes just propagated unaffected. The energy scrambling happened at the, the interfaces. So a question could come up, how do you reconcile that? Both have to predict the same phenomenon, the same overall electric field everywhere, the same performance of the device. Both have to predict that, yet they seem to be doing different things. Well, the way this is explained is that plane waves don't exist really anywhere, but they definitely don't exist inside inhomogeneous materials. So if we have a plane wave traveling through an inhomogeneous material, that means it's traveling through some kind of grating, which couples it to the other plane waves through the coupled mode theory. Uh, the eigenmodes, by definition, have to propagate independently, but plane waves aren't eigenmodes in an inhomogeneous material, so they have to exchange energy. So that's the difference, and that's how we reconcile it. And that concludes this lecture.